Oda, thanks for joining us. Uh, how was uh, this past weekend spending it with Tiger? It was great. I mean, the second consecutive week that he's really factored in the event, and it just energized our game. It just energized the people that went out to watch. It was it was truly sort of a, a rejuvenation of what what it was like to have Tiger in contention again in golf tournaments. Is has he ever asked you to be honest with him with what you see? I try and be honest uh, as honest as I can. I mean, I've I've been friends with him over thirty years. I know his golf swing, and so I'm I'm not the one that's going to interject anything that's unsolicited. But if he asks me, I'll be honest. And sometimes it's not the answer he's looking for. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but. You know, in terms of certain elements of his game, I mean, I was in a lot of conversations with him and Earl at a lot of dinners. Uh, you know, his first Masters, it was myself and Earl and Tiger. We all traveled together, from drove down from Atlanta. And so I've seen um, all the good and all the bad and, any, and everything in between. So it's, uh, it's, it covers a, a sort of a broad spectrum of issues at times, but um, we've had a really great friendship. What's the one concern, the biggest concern? Because uh, I don't think he's playing until Augusta. So what would be the one thing you think he's working on? Well, uh, project number one over the next two weeks is going to be the driver. I, I think there's two things that you would have to look at with regard to watching him play, and it doesn't show up on any of the statistics because you have to actually be out there and watch. But any time that he had to turn a shot right to left with trouble, with trouble on the left, he, he struggled a little bit off the 6th tee, off the ninth tee. Um, there were some errant shots, and then we saw the really horrible tee shot yesterday at 16 where he just talked about it in his post-round comment. He just didn't commit to a shot. And the worst thing that a professional athlete can do to themselves to compromise performance is not commit. And so he made a terrible swing, and that's the miss that is really difficult for him to recover from because he – the majority of his misses are out to the right. So when you, when you eliminate one half of the golf course, you can really make your way around, around, around the golf a lot easier. But when you have a two-way miss going, which sometimes creeps into his driver, it really makes it difficult to sort of take out some of the trouble that you're looking at when you're standing on the tee box. So he has to sort of really focus in on trying to find some way to navigate Augusta National with the driver because it's a course that's going to force you to hit driver. Who should be the favorite at Augusta? Right now, I think it should be Rory. I mean, I, I think um, the only thing going against Rory is no player has ever made the has has completed the career grand slam at Augusta National, so he's got history working against him. But his ability to hit his driver. So if you look at the two players, Tiger Woods sort of versus Roy McIlroy, right now the weakest club in Tiger's bag is his driver. The strongest club in Rory's bag is his driver. And you you go down to the other end of the spectrum. Tiger is phenomenal around the greens. He was second in the strokes gained around the green category this week at Bay Hill. Uh, and Rory often has, you know, he's not bad at all, but just is not as prolific in that particular area of the game. So it just kind of, it's an either or discussion. You know, if you want a guy that can drive it far, hits it straight and is not afraid to hit it uh, on the biggest stages, then you got to go with Rory. But if you want a guy that's won it four times, and can go around that golf course blindfolded, then you got to go with Tiger Woods. Rory said that they should limit alcohol sales. Uh, had a fan heckling him, uh, mentioning Rory's wife. You're there. You were a professional golfer. You were there with Tiger. You know how chaotic it can get. I mean, how how ugly, how personal does it get with this uh, with the fans? Well, I I, I think it's some. It, it's a little bit of a concern, um, and I, I think it's it comes down to Dan. You know where we categorize us ourselves as a sport. I saw some pretty ugly behavior at the 2016 Ryder Cup at Hazel Team. A lot of the American fans were kind of digging into the European side, which I, was a little, I have nothing against heckling. I've got nothing against sort of cheer rooting for your team. But when it, you cross the line and it gets personal, I think that's kind of a little bit overboard. And I think that what has to happen is the PGA Tour and the governing bodies of our sport need to do a better job of just 
observing and, and maintaining a secure workspace for the golfers because you, you there's there's no assigned seats. So it's very easy for someone to cause an issue like we saw with Justin Thomas at Honda. We saw yesterday with Rory. And with Tiger coming back and so many people wanting to come back, there is going to be some negative cheering out there against some of the other players, which is probably what Rory was experiencing. But I can tell you, I heard a couple of crazy things come out of people's mouths right, right as Tiger was swinging. And I tried to look around to see who it was, and I couldn't find them. So it's just a hard thing to police, but it's something I think the tour needs to monitor and sort of keep their eye on. Wait, what did you hear? Well, you know, the tip, the typical uh, Baba Booey, mashed potatoes, <laughs> let's go, Tiger. I mean, somebody that's just trying to get their voice on TV. And it's in, you know, after the ball's gone, that's fine. But, like, they were doing it right at the top of his swing. And, you know, he's so focused. And m- more, majority of these athletes don't even hear this stuff. But it, it it's one of those things to where, that's not, hasn't been historically a part of our sport where basketball and football, I mean, it's commonplace, but it's just kind of, I don't know if we have to get kind of get used to the modern age of golf or there has to be a little bit more policing as far as keeping the, the fans at least a little bit more reasonable in their cheering. Who would be the golfer you would send into the gallery to clean up things? He'd be your number one seed. Wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, I would have to go back back into the uh, the archives a little bit, and I'd bring full Malam out of the locker room. <laughs> he was a scary dude, man, big South African. <laughs> and, you know, full, when Fulton got mad, you stayed out of the way. But right now, sort of modern day, and I don't know if there's any connection here, it'd be another South African. I'd bring Big Ernie out. He's the international team captain. He's a huge man, and uh, he's a very imposing figure and I, I think if he went into the gallery and asked someone to sort of keep their mouth shut I, I i would probably assume they would listen to him you wouldn't send tiger in there ah uh, no not at all he's too much of a diplomat we we need someone in there that's not <laughs> mix it up a little bit how many times did you beat tiger woods in your career in a in an actual golf tournament um Probably a dozen times. I mean, when our first semester at Stanford, I was the number one player on the golf team, which many people don't believe. <laughs> and which is, and it's true. I've got a whole uh, list of teammates to, to back me up, but he took it over a second semester and sort of never looked back. But um, which is how I know the crowds that he attracts can somehow, you know, can sometimes throw other players off because when we were playing our collegiate events, it was the only time when we'd have a couple thousand people coming out to watch college golf when typically if you had more than 50 people, that was a big, big crowd. And they, they teed them off. Your, your fifth player teed off first, and then you'd work back through the lineup, and the number one guy would go off last. So Tiger was the number two guy, so he would go off before me. And I got through about you know, two thirds of the way through the season, I'm like, coach, I can't play behind him because there's people walking in the fairway. <laughs> there's people walking on the green. They're, you know, going to take a leak in the trees. I mean, it's just kind of like, I, I got like, can you put me in front of him and just put him behind me? But he took care of that. Cause he took over the number one spot and I didn't have to worry about that the rest of the season, but it, it can be, it, it, it not, not, I should, I shouldn't say this. it, it, it is a distraction. I mean, um, Bud Colley got a firsthand look yeah. at it yesterday. I haven't seen it that energized. When he made that putt on the 13th hole to get, I think, within one of the lead, I mean, the, the crowd, was they were just going nuts. And it was fun to be there. It was fun to be, you know, 15 feet away from him when he made that putt. I was on the call, and it was just uh, quite a sort of uh, interesting experience. I uh... – was listening to a podcast, Hank Haney's podcast, and he had uh, Jaime Diaz, the golf writer, and he said that what Tiger went through when Tiger was pulled over, he thinks that was a call for help. What do you make of that comment? Well, I think that any time an athlete or an individual is dealing with those sorts of um, battles with medication, um, alcohol, whatever it is, uh, at some point, yeah, there is there is a, a bottom where everybody bottoms out. And however you want to characterize it, depending on which 
self-help book you read, uh, you'll get a variety of different opinions. But I think the two most important things that came out of that is, number one, he didn't hurt himself or anybody else, which I think is, is critical. And secondly, he's gotten better because of it. He has changed his lifestyle. He's changed the way he's approached things. And he has come out a better person because of those experiences. And I think that in you know today's society where a lot of these athletes are just are living everything publicly through social media everybody has a voice it it's just good to see him sort of recover in the way that he did and he you know he went and sought out professional help which i think is the best thing to do because you know, there's a lot of things to unravel and he's done a good job of, of finding some firm footing he's relied on some great resources and um, you know, whether you want to characterize it as a call for help or just bottoming out, um, it, it's kind of depends on, like I said, who you talk to. Well said, well put, uh, Noda, thank you. We appreciate the time and, uh, perhaps we'll see you down the road. Thank you. Absolutely. Dan. Have a great day. That's Noda Begay, Golf Channel analyst, NBC sports on course reporter following Tiger Woods. 